you in just one second, Andrea. So let me stop my share right now. There we go, there's Andrea. Okay, if you can come on. There we go, okay. Shabbat Shalom and welcome. Okay, open your mic. Yeah, I'm already- How's that? Good, good, okay. Glad to have you here with us, Andrea. And I'm gonna introduce you, a, a lot of you here are familiar with her because Andrea, when we were functioning before, uh, she would come in sometimes, and she was coming from a good distance from Pasadena and join us. And then uh, she passed, she prepared some nice videos that we've used also on high holidays as I did today and Shabbat also. You know, I gotta say, Rabbi, if we have these services at night or in the afternoon, you might see a lot more. <laughs> Okay, uh, that's when I'm having lunch. That's the only thing. What can I tell you? Okay, so we're glad to have you here on board, uh, even if it's long distance this way. Beautiful service. Okay, thank you, thank you. And um, Andrea is, besides having a lovely voice and a very lovely personality, also is doing her doctorate in psychology. And I see very often on a Facebook page, you post very, very uplifting things, the things that you're doing, things that you're involved in. So that's why I brought you on board. And uh, I'm gonna say here, just as a, a lead in to this, that uh, you know, a, a kind of a tie-in with the, this Shabbat calling after Yom HaShoah, and it is on resilience and recovery. Uh, I think about here's our, our own Joe was on Zoom webinar this week, made it to Ken XT. Also, uh, about Yom HaShoah, right, right. And then here, Joe and Barbara, good examples of people who went through the severe trauma of the Holocaust. Joe, you visited every camp there was in Europe and just about, and Barbara, you were an orphan child and a uh, refugee in Central Asia. So the question that we have to ask is, you know, how do people manage to pick themselves up off the ground? And is this something we can learn? And indeed, it's very interesting that research of survivors found a very high prevalence of resiliency, <clears throat> forgiveness. Uh, it's about 70, 65% of the survivors scored very high on resilience traits. And 78% were engaged in processes, con processes considered resilient, felt they were transcendent or had engaged in behaviors that helped them grow and change over the years since the Holocaust, including leaving a legacy and contributing to the community. So these survivors have something that you know, gives us an indication that when the worst is the worst, you still can come forward. So I wanna just pull this up quickly because Judy Alkali sent me something interesting. I'm just gonna put it up on the screen. Let me get back to the share screen a second. One second, just to pull this up quickly. It was an unusual book she had come across. It was a handwritten art book by somebody done in one of the camps, Camp de Gaulle, 1941. Now, this is a, a roundup camp. It's not yet one of the labor camps and not yet, certainly not yet a death camp, but it was bad enough. There's about 15% died of disease and dysentery. But that is also very common problem in many refugees camps. But the title, very telling for us is, So is this aber so sein. This is how it is, pretty bad. This is how it should be. And you see this miserable rain pouring down on the barracks and then a kind of a castle on the hill with the sun shining on it. So, and she writes a beautiful little poetry in a colloquial German. And you can see here in the camp for real, it's raining all the time and we're stuck in the mud, but we really expect, right? this is how it should be. We can lie down and bake ourselves in the sun, get a nice tan. That's what we want to have. Or, Another one here, uh, 60 people in a barrack, uh, body lice in the clothes and fleas all over the bed. Uh, and that is our wonderful neighborhood. And then this is what it should be, a, a beautiful uh, castle uh, with wonderful furniture and uh, everybody's friends and wonderful company. That's how it should be, right? So uh, that's, hey, Rabbi? yeah. Can I, can I add a quick correlation? Go ahead. Wait, I'm going to close this down. Well, it's about, it's about that, actually. Oh, go ahead. 
So um, I, I don't speak colloquial German, so I don't actually know how it translates. Does it translate as should? Because I know every language has a different translation of should in English. It's very much, you know, it's developed like a kind of shame and pressure, like you should do this, right. you should be successful, you should be rich, you should be married. Does it translate as should or does it translate as some kind of desire? A desire, a desire. Okay. That's it. It's the desire. This yeah. is how it. Sh this is how we want, want it. it to be. That's yeah. right. right. Like a prayer. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's it. So, uh, okay. I'm just going to close it down. There, there are multiple pages. Magnificent piece was up for auction. Let me stop the share. There we go. Put the put it back to you. So, uh, let's highlight. Can you uh, spotlight uh, Andrew, uh, Barbara? Uh, no, no, Andrea. And spotlight Andrea so that she shows up on everybody's screen there. Pin, pin. Oh, spotlight. Yeah, that's it. Continue. There we go. Okay, that's it. Nobody, at least whoever wants me, wants me. That's not important. Okay. So, you know, it's a little bit Pollyannish, but maybe that's the solution to see the glass is half full rather than drained to nothing. So yeah. and I think of this because we're coming out of this long two years siege. It's and every once in a while we get this, oh, it's still not over, still not over, still not over. And it has a terrible toll emotionally, uh, increase in homicide, increase in violence, increase in domestic violence, drug overdose, very bad. Uh, social isolation, excess death because people postpone treatments and there are not enough physicians and hospital staff and so on to properly treat the way they did and could. And so that also took its toll. But now we're getting back, we would hope to some kind of normalcy. And there's a lot of anxiety people have about that. So I asked Andrea, would you help us and for people who are following on, uh, you know, with some guidance and advice? So uh, I'll let you take it from here. So sure, you tell I, us about uh, yourself, first of all, a little well, bit. Well, actually, first, thank you for such a beautiful service. I, I really enjoyed it. And actually, um, you played, I don't know which prayer it was, but you played a clip from a cantor in Warsaw with his yes. uh, son playing the piano. Right. That's Cantor Wisnia, right? Right, yeah. So he's actually the father of the rabbi that I grew up with. Oh. His grandson, Avi, who I was in love with for the first 20 years of my life, you know, oh. you have your eye on the rabbi's son. Um, there are at our, our home shul. That was my rabbi. So he's wonderful. He passed away very recently. Uh. Um, but he, yeah, they did a wonderful show and Avi carried on his music and his legacy. That's how he, that's how he survived the show I was playing music for the troops. So that, that was so interesting that you played that. My, my mother put it in the chat. She was like, I know him. Uh, yes, yes, I saw that in the chat. <laughs> oh, that's how you knew the secret. Wow, we, okay. Small world. So, besides almost marrying Rabbi's uh, uh, son. So what, tell us oh. more about yourself. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I am a, a student, a doctoral student in psychology, um, possibly forever, but possibly one day an actual psychologist. And I think this is such an important topic. Um, I actually, I see a lot of this in a lot of different ways, just people coming back and having to establish this new normal, because let's face it, in any large change, in any large trauma, communal trauma, things will, will never really be the same. They might be okay, it might be good, but they won't ever be the same, and that's okay. Um, and I think it's a really sort of apt subject for the Jewish people to talk about because let's be honest, we have a, quite a history of both personal and communal difficulties, right? And you know everything from recent Passover to Yom HaShoah to, to the Holocaust. But if you notice, you know, like, <clears throat> excuse me, you've heard the old joke, well, <clears throat> you heard the old joke, um, the Jewish holiday, they tried to kill us, we won, let's see. I mean, it's a joke because there's there's some truth in that. We have quite a history of, of survivorship. Um, and I think out of necessity from those experiences, we as a people have developed this, this really special um, resilience, like you said, and also compassion. Um, you'll see a lot of Jews in the healing profession. That's, that's not a coincidence. Um, and I think that we also feel, at least I feel this way, it's kind of our obligation, it's a mitzvah to use that compassion that we've learned, to use that resilience that we've learned to help other people. You know, like we've been there, we can help you, right? Um, so this applies very much to now, to, to coming out of COVID. How, how can we process all of these pains that people have experienced on, on so many levels and, and build kind of a, a full life again? 
So I think that that's a really good topic for us to consider. And I think we as a people have so much to offer in that vein. So, so what kinds of difficulties do you see people facing, whether they're aware of it or not, coming back to normalcy? What right? kinds of we're told are it's we officially not endemic, not pandemic. <laughs> kinds are we not facing? So, I mean, there's the very obvious ones of stress and that covers everything from, you know, just the stress of things being so different to the physical stress of not getting as much exercise because we're not going out to the worry. Oh my gosh, the impact that worry has on your body and on your brain. Stress is far and away the number one cause of disease, um, of all diseases. So it, that's the, that's the number one, that's the headline. Um, there's also the the physical the brain changes that happen over that long i mean i see people now who have trouble going into target because it's so bright and it's so loud and there's so many people and for two years they've basically been sitting home doing nothing and their brain has gotten used to that so it can be very overwhelming both like literally and metaphorically to go out into the world especially into a world that doesn't seem to be allowing for that transition period Actually, there's a lot being written about this right now that why are we expecting people to jump right back in when it's been such a trauma in some ways? Um, there's also loss. People probably experienced loss, if not of someone they love, then maybe of a job or an opportunity or a project or a hobby or money or of a business. There's, there's a lot of losses that I think we can all point to during this time. Um, so the challenge becomes really how to reconstruct life in different different circumstances. Like when we left Egypt, lost, well, pretty much everything, but we managed to reconstruct our lives. The thing is, it really has to be an intentional process. Um, I think a lot of people are just saying, well, you know, we'll just float back into normal. And I don't know that that's going to happen. There has to be a reconstruction, much like after leaving Egypt and after the Holocaust and after, you know, a lot of wars throughout history, there has to be an intentional reconstruction. Okay. Yeah, I, th I think a lot of things have to do also with what strategies that people adopt during this whole process. I, I, we went out. We made sure not to go breathe right next to anybody. We were outdoors as much as we could. So it kept us as walking and uh, everything was deserted. So everybody else stayed inside. Uh, that was our strategy. That was our strategy. So well, now let's get to, to now. What do, we, what do people need in order to recover and thrive? What do they need? Give us some, uh, some suggestions. Well, you know, if I could bottle it and sell it, we'd be millionaires and I would give it all to the temple. But <laughs> in absence of that, um, my, my personal thoughts, I think we need from a couple of sources. We need things from ourselves, which can often be the hardest because we don't exactly live in a culture of you know, self-care and um, taking time for ourselves. Um, we certainly need things from others, and I actually feel we need, we need things from the divine, which can come in a lot of ways. So from ourselves, um, I think we need, most importantly, self-compassion. There's a really wonderful book by Kristen Neff on self-compassion. It's a wonderful read. It's something we're not really familiar with. It's not kind of protocol in, in our lives these days in the modern world. Um, so I think we need to give ourselves some grace and compassion. Uh, I think it's really important to be aware of what we need, of what we're doing, of how we're feeling. Again, it's something we tend to rush right past. Um, in the same vein, I think we need to accept that, you know, this might be hard. This might, you know, we might be having difficulties. We're so eager to get back to things, get back to things that kind of tend to brush aside everything that's happened and not honor what's in some ways really just a healing process. And that takes a lot of patience as well. I think that's something else we need from ourselves. So compassion, patience, acceptance, you know, the same way you might treat a friend. Um, and actually speaking of that, you know, from others, there's so much we can offer others and there's so much that we also need from others. So for example, community, the community that you have managed to keep going this whole time is invaluable to people because so much isolation, we really need to break that habit. We're not meant to live alone, we're meant to be social creatures. Um, so if we can reestablish that kind of community and keep it going, that's that's absolutely precious. It's invaluable. Um, and even in a more one-to-one -one kind of way, I think that the validation we can offer each other, the support we can offer each other is so important because no, no one has gone through this unscathed, right? 
no one has come out. They're like, yeah, that was, that was totally fine. What's up now? Um, we've all been through something and recognizing that in each other is, is a wonderful way to heal and to move forward. Um, so that kind of sharing of experiences that, um, rebuilding even of trust in other people, because, you know, this whole time we've had to be wary. Oh, you have COVID, you have COVID, are you masked? Are you vaccinated? All of these things, but we've lost a lot of kind of inherent trust in, in our, our fellow humans. So that's important to rebuild. Um, and I think lastly, we need something from the divine. Now I am going to turn this over to you because this is not my area of expertise, but for me personally, a lot of people and even me personally have kind of turned away from religion or from the divine, which, you know, like that, that lovely book, why do good things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen to good people? Right. I think a lot of people are asking why has this happened to all of us for, for no apparent reason. Um, and so people have turned away from religion, from the divine. And I think that that's ultimately, it seems easy, but it can be ultimately pretty detrimental. I think even if, if someone needs to re-examine their, their concept of the divine, their God concept, um, so it makes sense in their new world, that that's okay. But I think it's important not to abandon that. I don't know, Rabbi, what you read about that or experienced um, with people. That's a very, a very good question because one, one of the things that people notice is that there's a move away from formalized religious organizations, again, because of this dislocation, uh, but compensated in some sense, maybe by alternate online communication connections or maybe individual spirituality, but they may not be factored in in any formal group. There is a great deal of research on the idea that people that have some kind of religious foundation tend to go through and ride out tough times more easily than people who have no sense of faith. It is like the sense of hope from a rationalist point of view, say there is no hope. We'll end up in the same place. But once we take that approach, then might as well shut, shut down. So there's something in this that when people have a sense of hope from something more powerful, that enables them to go forward in life. And that's really the, that's the key. Yeah. yeah. Any questions just at this point? Anybody? Car Carmen. Ask Andrea. Um, can you hear us? Yes, hello. Hey, how you doing? Yeah. Um, in, the, in terms, I mean, I understand the, the, the divine and all of that, but in terms of the practical, when you talked about a little bit earlier about the um, trust in, in each other in terms of is someone vaccinated or not? And that's a real issue, especially in our congregation where we have so many elderly people that when someone walks in the door, I mean, no one wants to wear a mask, mm -hmm. yet you don't, the only reason why you cannot wear a mask is if you're vaccinated. And the only way to, have, to know that is if you ask, because it, and there's a level, and by asking there's an implicit level of distrust already put there, like it happened this morning, actually. Mm -hmm. And so how do we, what suggestions do you have of, of um, being able to bridge those gaps and to, to not feel like you are being the the the, the plying the ointment or whatever it is at, at the party, and still ensure the safety of ourselves and all of all the others around us, because I cannot put my safety in the hands of somebody expecting that they are going to take care of me. I have to ask the question. Great. Yeah, definitely. Well, now I know how Dr. Fauci felt. Um, <laughs> No, it's, that's a really tough question. I'm, I'm not a scientist, so I can't speak to, well, how long will the vaccinations last and how long will the masks help? Um, but I understand what you mean in terms of that, that unsettling feeling, which is why, you know, in a lot of places in healthcare settings, for example, you still have to wear a mask no matter what. Um, in public transit, you still have to wear a mask no matter what. Now, I know that that's not a lot of fun. I've also been places, concerts, et cetera, where they simply check your vaccination card. Um, even some uh, healthcare offices to, to even show up in person, you have to provide them record of vaccination and then it's on file. So, you know, in some places that might work where you kind of have regular people filing in and, you know, LA has made it so easy. There's a digital version of your, of your vaccination record. 
you can just either put it on file with, for example, the temple or show it at the door. And if that's a policy, it doesn't feel as much like, well, I'm targeting you because you look like you're not vaccinated or I don't know who you are. If it's a policy and everybody has to kind of follow it and show it, I think every business has the right. Now, again, not a lawyer either, but I think every every institution has the right to, to set their own limits and requirements, right, regarding masks or vaccination. Does that, does that help, maybe? Does that make sense? Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Policy on metropolitan buses in Los Angeles is you do not have to wear a mask if you don't want to. They are not enforcing it. Really? I, th I thought that they just reinstituted it on public transit, like in the last week or so. Because like, yeah. they take a good amount of public transit. The county's going to drop it. CDC is dropping. A lot of these things are dropping. Partly yeah. because the vaccination doesn't prevent transmission. That's one of the things. Right. And the masking is only also partly effective. That's right, so we're dealing with incomplete solutions. Yeah, so yeah, there is risk. There is risk in everything. So one of the questions is how do we deal with risk? Yeah. And Andrea, risk a lot of Andrea, that's just Joe. Hi, Joe. I remember, I talked to you just a couple of weeks last week. Of course I remember, how could I forget? <laughs> so how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? Thank you. I'm fine. Service. Thank you. It was good to talk to you. It's yeah. very nice. I appreciate it very much. Cool. I was honored. <laughs> so yeah, I know risk risk creates a good a good amount of stress. And like the thing is, we don't we don't have answers. It's sort of there, but I know this isn't a Jewish thing, but there, but for the grace of God go I kind of thing, right? Like, well, is the mask helping? Is the vaccination helping? In a lot of ways, it, it makes us feel better, but we don't actually know to what extent it is helping, right? Everybody's got a different opinion. Okay, now, the last one. You came up with an acronym, SAVE. I do love uh, my acronym. As a way of <laughs> how we give each other support. Explain that to me. So I mean, it's very easy to say, well, support each other, be nice, trust each other, et cetera. But when it gets down to it, you know, we're kind of so ingrained in our ways that any change I think requires, like I said, some real intention. So again, when we left Egypt, it was not, yes, I know we say when I went out of Egypt, fine, but you didn't go alone. You went in a group. Seder is not a meal you eat by yourself. We left en masse, right? We went with each other. And how did we manage? We managed with each other. So I did come up with this acronym um, for ways that we can support each other. Easy to remember, it's SAVE, S-A-V-E-E. -E. So S stands for, Rabbi, you want to tell me? Because I, I gave you my cheat sheet. Um, cheat sheet, okay, support. Support. So support, a little big, but I think it's important to remember to give people what they need, not what you might need in that situation or not what you think they need or what they should need, but what they actually need. If you listen to what people are saying, they'll often really tell you, here's what I need. Like, this is what I need from you, whether it's practical support, emotional support, even financial support, social support, um, to support people in the ways that they need. And in turn, hopefully people will do that for you. So that's S. A. Accept. Accept. So tying into that, accepting that everyone is at a different point. Everyone does have personal concerns. Carmen is, is very concerned for her own health for, and other people are too, for other reasons. Some other people are not, they might be fine. So accepting that everyone's at a different point, everyone has different needs and implicit in that is respecting those, respecting those needs, not saying, well, why are you so worried about your health? It's totally fine, I'm totally fine. Right, that's you, that's your journey. Accept and respect that someone else is at a different place. So that's A, so support, accept, V, Validate. Validate. This is my favorite because I, I don't know. Maybe it's a therapist thing. They they knock this into your head. Um, we are not really in the habit of validating each other. You know, we tend to listen to each other and say, "Okay, I heard you. Now it's my turn. Let let me talk. I want to say something." Right? It's so powerful, and I I know it might sound really cliche, but it's so powerful to simply acknowledge that you're hearing someone. Right? 
to put forth that act of listening, to hear what they're saying, save your part. You'll get to talk later, but save your business. And, you know, there's a lot of easy phrases that, again, might sound cliche, but they're so powerful. Imagine if someone said to you, wow, I understand. That makes a lot of sense. That must be really hard. How did you manage? That's one of my favorite because it really, it helps people find their strengths. You know, how did I manage? That was hard. How did you manage that hard situation? Wow, I really admire your strength, your dedication, your will to survive, right? So that sort of validation is so, so powerful. We often tend towards pity, shame, guilt. I feel awful. You poor thing. That's horrible, right? That's, that doesn't, oh, now we're having a cat. Sorry. <laughs> um, you know, that doesn't make people feel good. My that cat. makes them feel, yeah. Hi. Right, so God, so go on the floor. Thank My you. <laughs> um, pity doesn't feel good. Often we think, you know, compassion comes across as, as pity and we, we don't realize it. We think we're being kind when really it just sounds like, oh, wow. And the person feels even worse. So saying things that simply recognize what they're saying, that you hear them as a human, that you understand, that you admire their strength, that, that is real validation. So um, it's, 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 it's giving a compliment, but not making it schmaltzy. It's giving us a soft compliment. So yeah, that the person- A genuine compliment. Yeah, feels like then would open up. Whereas if you said, uh, gee, it's a pity, it's, it's shut down, you want to shut Right, down. that's like, that's kind of trivial, trivializing almost, right? So someone says, you know, I lost my, my, my business during the pandemic. Oh, that's a shame. Okay, that's also a conversation stopper as yeah. opposed to, wow, that must have been really hard. You're, you're saying, yeah, that's a reasonable reaction that you're having. How did you manage to, you know, keep your family together because that shows their strengths. They did manage to keep your family together, right? So it's, it's really small turns of language that can have so much power. Um, yeah, so that's V. So support, accept, validate, and? Then E, or encourage. Encourage, because you know once we've acknowledged what's happening, acknowledged how, how painful it can be, we encourage people. Let's not confuse encourage with give someone advice, unless they say, hey, Rabbi, I need some advice, right? A lot of times we want to give advice, we want to problem solve. People, people come to us and they want validation, they want to be heard, they want compassion and friendship. They don't necessarily want advice because chances are they've, they've thought about all these problems. If they want advice, I'm sure they'll ask. Um, so once you hear someone, don't give them advice, maybe ask them about their future, about their plans, about, you know, do you have a, a thing you're gonna do about this? Do you, you know, do you have a way forward? What, what are you thinking about, right? And that also encourages them maybe to think about new things and you'll get into a conversation and you'll inspire them, but you won't be giving them advice. You should do this thing, right? Should is not a, is not a word I love. <laughs> That's what you said about the book with the Yeah, book. well, people should on themselves, it's like, you, then there's a shame involved if it doesn't happen, right? As opposed to, I want this to happen, which is aspirational. So yeah, and, and in that way, encouraging people, you can also praise the efforts that they are making to move forward. Because the same way that they're, how they got here wasn't the same as how you got here, how they're gonna move forward is not the same as, as how you might move forward. I think that it's one of the, maybe it's Rogers, uh, classic schools, was to recognize that people have the tools inside themselves. You just ha your job is just to help clarify it and bring it out, help them bring it out. Is that right? right. Let people, because the courage and the strength comes inside if they know where it is. Right. Yeah. I mean, think about it. I'm sure a difficult time in everyone's past, you've run into someone who you really, you wanted compassion, you wanted guidance, you wanted encouragement, right? And they probably gave you advice and a to-do list. And you thought, well, that's that's saying that my efforts aren't good enough. And you didn't really hear what I said, right? That's that's not a great feeling. It doesn't it doesn't move us forward, it doesn't build us back together as a community. And then I ask you this also. There are all, all sorts of techniques. When when somebody feels tense or anxious, uh 
uh, let's say somebody you know, has to go out, be very concerned, who am I going to bump into? Haven't bumped into anybody in a long time. What can I do to relax? Do you have some, we can even try something with the people here. Yeah, so again, like you said, stress, worry, stress, concern, just everything spinning around our brains are really constructed to focus on the negative things in order to keep us safe. That's not, that doesn't really make for a happy life though, right? If we're constantly freaking out about everything. Um, if you haven't experienced that, take it from me. It doesn't, it doesn't help. Um, so we need to find a way to center ourselves to kind of let all that stress fall to the wayside. So our happier ourselves, our souls can sort of come out and reassert themselves. So uh, something I do a lot with my clients um, is meditation. I promise I'm not a hippie, at least by California standard. Um, but there's, there's so much research, there's so much evidence on the benefits of meditation really in any form that, that works for someone. Um, why? Because it gives this, this chatty worry mind, this stress mind, something to do. It's like giving a toddler a toy to play with and then, you know, shuts up for a little bit <laughs> and the rest of you can come out and be calm. But really it, physiologically, it changes how your brain works. It changes your stress response. It activates your parasympathetic nervous system. It's just like all around good stuff. Like if we could put it in a pill, it would be great. Um, there's tons of forms that work. Um, I love to do like a short thing that that is so easy to do, even if you're out in public and um, kind of find yourself in a stressful situation. Um, if you're up for that, we can try it together. You want to walk us through something? Yeah. Sure. So a lot of... Okay. Yeah, a lot of meditation focuses on breathing because it is literally the most natural thing in the world. But when you're stressed, you stop breathing. You don't breathe deeply. You don't get as much oxygen. Your muscles get tense. You get a little lightheaded because you don't get oxygen. And in focusing on, hi, sweetheart. <laughs> in focusing on breathing, um, you, can, you can regulate it in a lot of ways. So a lot of meditation focuses on breathing, it focuses on awareness. It gives your, your chatty brain something to do. So let's try this. Uh, I don't know how much you can see me, but if you sit back, sit up in your chair, I'm lean back so your, your spine's kind of supported and straight. And if you, and feet on the ground, so no cross legs, feet on the ground, really get back in touch with where we come from. Um, and if you're comfortable with it, close your eyes. If not, you can focus softly, like on the one spot in front of you, maybe on the ground. So I'm going to close my eyes because I like it. Actually, no, because my notes are here. Uh, <laughs> um, so take a deep breath in through your nose. And we're going to do it, what we call box breathing. So it's going to be in for four, hold for four, and then out through your mouth for five, right? When your out breath is longer, it literally calms your whole system down. So let's try it. We'll go in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, five. In, hold, out, once more. In, hold, out. Okay, leave your eyes closed or on the soft focus in front of you. Really feel your, your seat bones grounded into the chair, your feet on the floor, your back against the chair. So you can really feel your, your physical body in space. Take in kind of, uh, if you're in the synagogue, if you're able to be in the synagogue this morning, take in kind of the holy feeling around you because that is such a special place. Um, Keep breathing in through your, your belly, expanding that, that space uh, in your diaphragm, in your belly. And um, tune into your senses. So for example, um, can, you, can you name in your head four things that you're physically feeling? So for example, okay, I, I feel, you know, this little breeze that's blowing. Um, I feel the softness of, of, my, of my sweater. Um, I feel my, my, my bottom on the, on the chair. So really tuning into your physical body and it's giving your brain something to do, something to think about. So take a few breaths thinking about that. 
You can feel my heart beating. That's good. And then do the same thing for things that you might hear. Um, so, okay, I, I hear the air conditioning. I hear my cat meowing. I hear Andrea talking. I hear my own breath. So see if you can identify three things that you're hearing. And then see if you can tune into your sense of smell. What are two things maybe that you smell? You smell the, the smell of the Torah because it was out and has that beautiful old smell. Um, maybe your, your special perfume scent that you wear on, on Shabbat. There, are there two things you can smell? Even things that aren't nice. I can smell the cat food. Kind of the last thing I like to do in this sensory awareness is to identify in this moment something that you feel gratitude for. It can be from small to enormous, um, grateful that you are able to be at the synagogue, grateful for the beautiful weather, grateful to be alive, grateful for your cat. So I like to, in this moment to think about just one thing that you're really grateful for. Now take a second and see in your body, in your shoulders, in your chest, in your whole body, how do you feel in terms of stress and in terms of calm and serenity and groundedness um, after doing that? That was literally like four minutes, five minutes of just regulated breathing and some sensory awareness. Oh, you can open your eyes if your eyes are closed. Um, and that's a very quick thing that people can do. Even, you know, like I said, out in public, you don't need a meditation garden or a cushion or anything. Just that awareness and breathing brings us back into our bodies, turns off our worry brains and kind of calms our nervous system. So I'd, I'd be curious to hear how, even after that, that tiny little check-in, um, how people are feeling. How are you doing? Okay. It's good. All right, Karen, you us to relax. You know, I like the last point you said about feeling some gratitude, because I think that it's recognized, widely recognized, that that's one of the core issues. When people feel the things, when they have it coming to them, they don't get it, frustrated, they're angry, they break out, they burst out. So when you appreciate what you have, it's much easier then to say, okay, what do I need? Now, it's obviously different from being uh, somebody sitting in an apartment in Los Angeles, sitting in an apartment in Kiev, you know, with the missiles flying, you know. But most of us are not there. We're here in relatively safe places. But even so, I, I bet you if you asked Joe or Barbara, they would say that, you know, in, in their youth and their most difficult times, that gratitude is probably something that got them through. It's, it's, a, it's an instinct in some ways, but there's also so much research that shows, I think it's like if you keep a gratitude journal for two months, 70% like of people saw an increase in happiness. Um, I mean, they make gratitude journals or you can just write down three things you're grateful for in that day. Um, when we have Shabbat here, we always say, what are three things I'm grateful for this past week? You know, um, so that it rewires you. It literally does because we're, we're built to remember negative things to keep us safe, right? Keeps us safe doesn't necessarily keep us happy. Yeah, but you know, interesting also in, in, in Judaism, one of the core, one core concept is the idea of Hakarat HaTov. One must always give thanks or that which is good. And even when things are not good, you give thanks because maybe it will lead to something good. Right, and it could always be worse. That's right, <laughs> that's right, that's right. Yep. Okay, Can, and yeah, that's it, it can always be worse. There's a good answer, there's a good answer. It could be raining, uh, that was the... Uh... Andrea, I want to thank you so much. I think oh, thank you. Feels rested and relaxed, and now are getting and in go terms ahead. Of, yeah, sorry. In terms of meditation, there are so many good free guided meditations yeah. on YouTube. It's not just sitting in the corner and not listening to anything. And I, that would drive me nuts. But there's so many guided ones where they just instruct you how to focus on your breath or yeah. instruct you what to think about, kind of like we just did, but probably with a much nicer voice. Um, and they're, you know, they're free in five minutes, 10 minutes. It can really make such a difference if, if it's something you keep doing. No, I think that this, the idea of being able to sit back and 
unwind, especially when we're going to go, when we go into some situation, we know it's going to be a difficult situation. Bring it to a doctor's exam or meet with the IRS, you know, things like that, or a neighbor that has been annoying us, right? So, and how to go through, calm down a little bit. So then it's easy to take and deal and work with. Very important. Yeah. I want to thank you so much. Thank you for gracing us with your presence and your words. Appreciate it very much. And I hope that you know, people who are here and people who are watching either Facebook or YouTube or will see this later on, we will be able to share. I'll get you uh, a link so you can share it with people if you want also. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and to your mother, hello. And uh, Shabbat Shalom to you also. I see Simon and Doug. And to, and to Dan, yes, to Daniel also. Everything good. Okay, to everybody, we're going to go ahead now. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Thank you. Shalom. And we're going to go and go Thank into you. Adon Olam. Okay. I'm just going to go ahead. Let me pull it up. And let's see. Here we go. What happened? What happened? What happened? Let me get to yeah, I did ID. <laughs>
Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Next week, we're going to mark Yom Atzmut Israel Independence Day. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, we give you excused absence. Okay.